Hey, welcome to Online Easter Church at Compassion. Have you ever done church like this? <laughs> no, and I hope I never have to again. It's, uh, it is certainly different, man, than any way we have ever done Easter, but it is what it is, and we are uh, excited once again to be coming to you online, uh, this time on Easter Sunday morning. Now, just want you to know right off the bat, before we get into our worship service, we're going to do things a little bit differently. And when I say differently, what I mean is, is, um, here, here's what you can expect. We're going to have a, a couple of songs from our worship team. Our kids have a little special element. We've got some people who are going to share a story with you that will blow you away. And then we're going to we're going to do communion together because it is such a special day. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Lord Jesus, thank you for our friends, for everyone who's joining. Holy Spirit of God, we ask you to be in this service today. Have your way. Take off with it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we go. Let's get to worship. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested, my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you release from my chains i'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he canceled my debt and he called me his friend When death was arrested and my life began It's your grace so free washes over Displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose without freedom in hell That's when death was arrested in my life Now life begins with 
Forever for the redeemed, yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested in my life, be dead. When death was arrested in my life, be dead. That's when death was arrested in my life, be The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon Him. As heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. The stars
and you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. Guys, we want to just continue our time of worship right now. Uh, this is the portion of our service where we worship God through our giving. And so on a weekly basis, man, those of us who call Compassion Church home, it's not a duty for us to, to give like a lot of people make it out to be. But really, it's an honor to say, God, here is our offering to you. We're, it's it really is a way of saying thank you, God, for your presence in our life and for the way that you provide things. And so what we see happening is when, when we engage this thing of investing in God's kingdom and when we're willing to invest in what God's doing, what God does is he says there's a person, there's a family who is investing in the lives of others because when you give to the church, you're not only helping uh, make things happen like keep the lights on at church, but you're serving the community. And when you have open hands like that. God says, that's a person that I can pour more into because I know that they'll use it to help others. So in a time like this, I think the church sometimes comes under scrutiny. Say, why are you still asking people to give to the church? Well, we're just a conduit that, that resources flow through. And we're here because we're trying to help do services like this. We're helping in our community and we're just continuing to be the hands and feet of Jesus right here. So this is our time of giving. And so if you're someone who comes Calls Compassion Church your home and you feel compelled to give uh, one time or on a regular basis, this is the time where we do this. All of the links for how you do that are going to be listed on the screen below, but this is our time. I want to take just one moment right now to thank God for his goodness in these hard days. God, I just thank you. I thank you right now, Lord, that, that as, as hard as it is, there's a lot of struggle right now. Lord, in the last couple of weeks, we've talked with lots of business owners who are struggling. We've talked with lots of families who are fearful. We've talked with a lot of people who are just exhausted from being inside and not in a normal routine. But God, at times like this, we remember your words and you tell us that you're working things out before us. You're cleaning up things behind us and you're for us. And because of that, God, because of who you are, because of your love, we're pouring into you. God, I thank you that you have provided resources. and We ask that you bless everything that comes in through this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for your continued generous support of this ministry. So we told you in the beginning, in the welcome time, that the theme that runs through this day is hope has a name. Rather than preaching some long-winded preacher message to you today, I thought it would be um, much more meaningful to you to be able to listen to real life stories. A lot of you who are watching this right now, you have been through some things in your life where, where, where life was upside down and backwards, it was terrible, and then God showed up and you came out of it. Some of you who are watching right now, you're in that place and you're like, when does it turn around? Is it going to turn around? Well, for you today, if you're someone who is looking right now, today, to find hope, I want to introduce you to three people who were in similar circumstances, somewhere similar to where you are right now. Listen to their stories about how hope 
showed up in the person of Jesus. I want to share my story, a story of a imperfect man who's loved by a perfect God. 13 years ago, I had found myself in a financial situation where it seemed like there was no getting out of it. Not because of anything I did, I just uh, didn't have a very good job, um, no education, so nothing seemed to be going my way. Uh, then the friend that I had decided just one day that he didn't want me to be his roommate. So uh, asked me to leave. Uh, I went to the church that I was attending at the time. I told the pastor that the only thing I knew to do was to go back to Florida. And he like adamantly like, no, that's not what you're doing. You're going to pack up your stuff and you're going to stay right here in the church. Now, mind you, I had been a part of the church at that time, I don't know, maybe six, seven months um, and had given my life to the Lord again, but had not fully committed. Um, so I knew that there was no room. So finally, I just felt something in my heart like, you know, all right, let me just go ahead and obey this guy. Um, he shows the love of Christ that I'd never seen before. So I was like, OK, well. If that's what you want me to do, Pastor, then that's what I'll do. I trust you. So about three days later, I moved into the church, have all my stuff in this little storage room. And I was living in the closet of the church. I don't think the, the closet was about 12 feet by three feet, 12 feet long, three feet wide. Um, no room to really lay because there was chairs and and I would sleep on the chairs or I would stack them up and I would uh, lay on the floor and. And I was just content, like, okay, well, Lord, this is what you want me to go through. I don't really understand it, but the pastor seems to know what he's doing, so I'm going to just trust it. About a week into it, <laughs> the pastor had called me on a little, I don't know if y'all ever heard of Kiwi, but there was little prepaid phones. <laughs> and uh, he was like, I got a song I want you to sing this morning, man. But you need to learn it this morning. I know you never heard it. So I went ahead and I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, whatever you want me to do, Pastor. And got and learned the song and got up that morning. It was from my favorite artist, Fred Hammond, called uh, Please Don't Pass Me By. Y'all need to check that out. And sang the song. I don't think I made it through the song first verse. I'm on my knees and I'm crying and lyrically the song was about the man who heard Jesus coming because he was blind and he knew that the only way his situation would change is if he got Jesus attention. He screamed out Jesus thy son of David have mercy on me and you can really go into that story you ever read that story I promise you it'll bless you um, because it was so many parts of that story that really blessed me but the one thing that it, it taught me was that in a moment that seemed like there was no hope, like it seemed like there was no way out. There was nothing, that I, I was at my darkest moment. I recognized that I needed to get Jesus' attention. Every worship service, <laughs> I had to raise my hands a little higher. Every worship service, <laughs> I had to sing a little harder. If the pastor asked me to run, I ran. If he asked me to clap, I clapped. <laughs> Because I knew at that moment, I could not get myself out of my situation. So the song taught me I needed to grab Jesus' attention. I did that for a year and a half living in that church. What the pastor needed me to do, I did. I vacuumed. I took the trash out. I sang. I worshiped. I whatever. If when there was no one in the building... I did exactly what I needed to do because I needed God to change my situation because I had become convinced that there was no hope, that there was absolutely nothing that was going to change my situation, that it, it was the, I was at the end. But then the pastor got up and he preached a sermon shortly in, within that year, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And it changed me. Because then it made me realize I've been so stuck in my own misery that I'm not even thinking about what you've done for me. So then I, I went from, Lord, I need your attention to now, Lord, you have got my attention. 
and I'm going to do whatever it is you need me to do. God, you need me to walk. You need me to go talk to him. You send me, Lord. I don't, don't look for nobody else. Call on my name. I'll do what you need me to do, God, because now you got my attention. Like Paul said, I am fully convinced. I am now been apprehended by that which I've been trying to apprehend. Lord, whatever it is you're trying to do, I want to be a part of it. And I did that for a year and about a year and a half. And I was so, I mean, man, when I tell you I was rooted in Jesus Christ, <laughs> I had given up all of like, I had given up some friendships. I had given up, uh, you know, uh, hanging out in the nightclubs. I had just given up stuff like, no, no, I'm not dating. I don't want to be with no woman. I want to be fully committed to the Lord. That had become so strong in my heart that God had to come to me in a dream. And he said, listen, I'm going to send you your wife. Now, I know the word says that he that findeth the wife findeth the good thing and findeth the favor of the Lord. He said, but Elliot, you're not looking. So I'm going to need to send you. I'm going to have to send you your wife. When she comes into your life, you're going to know that it's a time to change. It's a time to transition. So that year and a half, um, I watched God move me from ha literally having nothing to I ended up getting a really good job working security and getting into an apartment that needed no credit check, no down payment. It was just amazing what God was doing. And then he introduced me to my wife that I'm with today. But I'm, I'm just here to tell you that no matter what the situation looks like, if you stay rooted and grounded in Christ, he promises in his word that you're going to prosper. You, you know, he's not going to leave. you. He's not going to forsake you. There is hope. And that hope is named Jesus Christ. It all kind of started back in California because that is where I grew up. And I was actually not born in California. I was born in Mexico. Um, and we decided to move to California when I was about... Uh, three, four years old. So growing up, I went to school in California, went, did the whole thing over there. And it wasn't until I got into junior high and high school that I really wanted to do something for myself because I was always quiet, reserved growing up. So I thought, you know what, let me try to get some friends. Let me try to be popular during high school. And then junior high started. That's when all the alcohol started. That's when all the girls partying the whole shebang, and then come freshman year in high school, that's when sports started to get involved, that's when football started happening, that's when track and field started happening, and looking at my life at that point, I thought it was good, I was, I was living the dream life, I thought everything was perfect, everything was good, I had what I thought were good friends, um, and sports were going great, I was doing real good in football, real good in track, but then it wasn't until the end of my sophomore year that I don't remember because I got blacked out at a party and I woke up the next morning at my friend's house and there were like some of my best friends um, during high school and they told me like, hey, we're going to go celebrate our cousin's birthday, Chuck E. Cheese, it's going to be great, do you want to come? And I was like half hung over. But then I remember getting to Chuck E. Cheese and I just felt terrible from the night before. And I go to the bathroom and I end up throwing up all in the middle of the bathroom out of Chuck E. Cheese. And at that point I thought, there has to be more to life than just this. Um, I can't continue to just go down this path because if I do, next time I find myself in the situation, it might not be at a Chuck E. Cheese. So then that's kind of when the ball started turning and that's when I started looking for that bigger purpose in life. And then track season comes around and I start training, I start running, I start doing what I need to do. And then one of my coaches, he was known as the good coach. If he coaches you, like you'll be set. And I thought, he's not gonna coach me. Like I'm the new kid. So I just sat there. And then one practice, he just comes up to me. He's like, hey, points right at me. And he's like, you're running with me. And I was like, you want me to run with you? And I was like, all right, let's give this a shot. So I started running with him, practicing, and one of the cool things that he did is he would pick up the rest of my teammates and he would actually take them to church. And then at one point, one of my teammates that we were running together, he was like, hey, we're going to church on Friday, it's a good Friday service, like, do you want to come with us? And in my head, I thought, who goes to church on a Friday? Like, you're weird, first of all, it's not Sunday, it's nothing special, but I was like, you know what, I'm trying to find something better, so let's give this a shot. So I went with him, I started going to church, I started going to a Bible study with teenagers that we all ran track and field together, and I remember giving my life to Christ right before my junior year started in high school. 
And my whole junior year, it was great. Uh, it's like a huge weight just got lifted off my shoulders and sports was doing great. And that's around the time that I ended up getting a scholarship to go around track and field. And I thought, this is great, because it was a Christian college that was in Kansas. And they were willing to give us a scholarship to go run. And I thought, perfect, it's Christian, I'm gonna learn about God, I'm gonna run, which is what I love to do. And all the pieces started to fall into place. But then right before senior year started, I had to go take a test to get like the final improvement. So I took the test, my dad picks me up, and my dad is like the super quiet, reserved guy. So I thought, oh, he's not saying much. It's, it's not that big of a deal, but it was like that awkward silence. So I was like, what's happening here? This is not normal. So as soon as we pull up into my parents' house, that's when he sits me down and he's like, hey, like we're super proud of everything you're doing. Like you're doing tremendous things, but you can't go. So I was like, wait a minute, like, what do you mean I can't go? Like I got the scholarship, everything's good. Like I'm ready to go. And then that's when he told me that we were in the country illegally. Um, when we came as a kid, we came through my dad's work permit. But when that work permit expired, we decided to stay regardless. So I grew up without knowing that I was undocumented the whole time. And that, for me, really broke everything down. Um, after that, like I had to turn on the scholarship. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't want to take it out on my parents because I knew they were doing it for the better of me and my brother and my sister. But I had to take it out on somebody, so I turned my back on God, and I was like, God, this is dumb. How can you not do this for me? Like, this doesn't make any sense. So I turned my back on God, and after that, it was just this downward spiral, because where I grew up, um, there's border patrol checkpoints everywhere to get out of the city. Like, I, I couldn't go anywhere, because I had to pass a checkpoint, and if they ask me if I'm a citizen, I can't lie to them, and if they find out, back to Mexico I go. So it was just this downward spiral of uh, hopelessness, of depression, of days that I didn't want to move, I didn't have any energy to do anything. I just didn't want to be alive at some point and it just got so bad that I was like, what in the world is happening with my life? And it lasted far too long. Um, I, even after I graduated high school, it just kept going down and down. I went back to my old friends, I went back to my old habits, and I was really in this place of hopelessness. And it wasn't until some friends of mine invited me to another Bible study. I kept telling them no, because I was like, I don't want to deal with this. Like, y'all do your own thing. But they were so persistent that at some point I just told them like, if you'll be quiet about it, I'll go with you, just so you stop bothering me. So I ended up going to this Bible study with them. And then that's when I saw people my age that were actually living for Jesus, that actually had that hope inside of them that I was like, God, these people have dealt with their fair share of stuff, their trials, their things that they're going through, but they still choose to be worshiping you. They still choose to be living a life for you. And that broke my heart because I started thinking, God, why couldn't I do that? Like, why did I have to throw my temper tantrum? Why did I have to turn my back on you when things didn't go right? And it's just, it, 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 it forced me to go back to him. Because of that, it, it took a while, but I decided to get baptized as kind of my stamp of being like, hey, this is me giving my life back to you, God. Um, I, I can't do anything about it. If I made my peace saying, if you want me to go back to Mexico, I'll go. I really don't want to. But if that's your plan, then so be it. And I made my peace with him. And then that's when he started bringing a little bit of hope into my life. Because of that, I was able to get a work permit through uh, a bill that President Obama passed when he was still in house. And because of that, I was able to travel to New York City to do ministry there. I was able to come here to Virginia, but it wasn't until I completely surrendered my life to Jesus that I was actually able to find my purpose, to find my hope. And that hope was in Jesus. The first time that I met Jackie, um, <laughs> my dad told me on Monday of that week that I was going to a play on Friday, and then in the car on the way to the play, he said, oh, by the way, we're going to be my girlfriend there, and this is our son's play, and it's going to be really fun, and I had no clue. And at that time, tell me what life was like for you. When I was 15, my mom passed away, and then I had to step in in a big way in my sister's lives and my dad was still a pastor at the time. He was really busy with work stuff, and so a lot of the times I had to 
fix dinner and help with homework and help around the house and stay home from friends and watch out for the girls. So when I met you, you were mom and sister and partner in crime with your dad and still trying to be a high school student and still trying to be normal, right? Yep. Now, fast forward to uh, Jeff and I taking you to George Mason University. Tell me about that day. It was really hard to transition from being mom to being a normal teenager. And it was really hard to figure out because I was in survival mode for so long that when I went to college, it was about like day by day and living second by second. It was really hard to figure out what to actually do with my life and what to actually, how to make these big decisions when for so long I had been staying above the water. It was hard to be able to do what I wanted to do and know what I wanted to do and know how to do it. And your relationship with Jesus when you went to George Mason University was? I grew up and my dad was a pastor, so my whole life I believed in God, and I always wanted a relationship with God, but I never knew how to do it. And so I always said I was a Christian, said I was a believer, always grew up in church, was always involved in church, was always loved the church, all of my friends and family, and every relationship I had was through the church, and all of my social interactions were through the church. But when I went to college, I was really trying to figure out how to create my own relationship with God, but I didn't know how to do it. So for a long time, I was really struggling with whether or not, because I couldn't get a relationship with God myself, whether or not He was real or whether or not He was real to me. And so for a lot of college, I struggled with trying to develop a relationship and trying to decide what religion I wanted to believe, what was true to me, what, because I had been I loved the church, but I didn't know. I knew my dad's church, and so I didn't have my own church, and I, I knew my family's church, and I knew all of my friends were in the church, so I didn't know if I liked the church because of the people that I grew up with and around. And then when my mom passed away, a lot of the people in my life that I knew through the church, a lot of those relationships broke off. A lot of those people turned against me, and so a lot of my relationship with God was through my relationship with people that believed in God. And so when I didn't have those relationships, I struggled a lot to figure out what I really believed because I didn't know how to have a relationship with God myself because I'd always relied on everyone around me to do it for me. And so you're trying your best to figure it out and then your dad and I pick you up from George Mason and your dad asks you a question. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Are you further away from God, or are you closer to God, having gone through all of it? And do you remember your answer? I said further away, and I really meant it, because at that time I didn't know whether I believed in God or not at all. And then I came home, and I decided that the only way to have a relationship with God was to have a relationship with God, and that doesn't make sense, but let me explain. My whole life had tried to be good enough or tried to do enough or tried to take care of the people around me enough to make God want me. I had to want God more than I wanted God to want me, if that makes sense. And so for the next year, I had to switch everything up. And so when I started, I didn't believe in God at all, but I was the fakest Christian, but it was the best thing for me. So I decided to fake it till I could make it and get as involved in the church as possible and pray as much as possible and worship as much as possible and pretend that I believed in God until it finally clicked. And I don't know if that makes sense if you haven't been through it, but I was trying so hard to make people think I believed in God that I just stopped caring what people thought and just started trying to have my own relationship and in my room every night when no one was looking I would watch sermon after sermon after sermon and worship song after worship song after worship song and pray for hours and I didn't believe in God at all but that was what brought me closer to God. Tell me about how that affects you when you work with the children and the youth at church. I think a lot of people in the church think that you need to act like you belong in the church to be in the church. You can't belong in the church until you've been in it long enough and been surrounded by the people and had the love and given the opportunities. The kids that the teachers yell at or get mad at or the kids that get in trouble at school, I try my hardest to show them what I was shown because I, I know how much it hurts when people of the church look away from you. So now your relationship with G, it's a relationship. It's yeah. not... And it is full-blown. You are all in. Tell me about where your hope now comes from. 
my hope is in Christ, and my hope is in the Lord, because I still have no clue what I want to do with my life, still don't know where I'm going, but it's okay, because I still know my purpose, and I know what I'm working towards, instead of just trying to find something to glorify myself, I'm trying to find something to glorify the Lord, and to live in a way that honors Him, so it doesn't really matter what I do now, because it doesn't have to be the perfect thing, as long as it's pointing someone towards God. Well, in some ways, I don't know that you need any more than what you've already heard, but 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 I feel compelled on, on Easter Sunday to at least go to the resurrection and see a portion of it. I'm not going through the, the whole story. You you already know the story, but 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 what you maybe don't know is what's going on in the minds of some of the people who are so close to Jesus. I mean, if you can put yourself in their mindset, these are people who who had had left everything, had left everything, family, careers, to follow Jesus. And they saw Jesus do things that no one had ever seen anyone do before. And he told them, it's not going to last forever. I'm getting you ready so that you can do things that nobody's ever seen you do before. And you're going to do greater things than I've ever done. But in some ways, they didn't get it. Some ways they couldn't get it. And so on that day, they watched as their hero, their savior, their Lord was crucified and they watched as he actually died on a cross and his body was taken off of that cross and put into a tomb and time passed by. Go with me to John chapter 20. Verse 1 of John chapter 20, it says, Early... On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And you've heard that verse. Some people have read that to you every Easter Sunday. But when you slow down and read that, and it says, it says early on the first day of the week, why, why was she going there early on a Sunday? She was going there early on a Sunday because Jesus was crucified on Friday, and they didn't have time on the Friday to do the anointing and everything that needed to be done. And then the next day was the Sabbath, and in that culture, they could do no work. So, so early on Sunday was the soonest that she could come and get his body and anoint him and properly bury him. And so before the sun even comes up, can you imagine in Mary Magdalene's mind, all day Saturday, he's just lying there in that tomb. He's not even properly prepared for burial. I can't sleep, but as soon as I can get there, I'm going to Jesus. And even though he's not alive, I got to get to him. See, what you may not know is Mary Magdalene is a woman who, who Jesus had met in all kinds of sorrow and trouble and a terrible lifestyle. And as bad as you can imagine, he stepped into her life and took her from where she was to where she was now. What you may also not know is that Mary Magdalene, we see in, in another part of Scripture where she and some other ladies traveled with Jesus and financially they helped make it possible for Jesus and his disciples to do what they did. She was invested in what he was doing. For him to just be laying there in the grave, in the tomb, was not okay for her. So early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, broken hearted, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. What did she see? Verse 1 says she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, again, I'm just asking you, just, just, just go in the story. Put yourself in the place of Mary Magdalene. What's she thinking? I'm heartbroken. Friday, I saw what I saw. I saw him on the cross. I saw them take him down. I saw him placed in the tomb. I saw the soldiers roll the stone all day Saturday. Hope is gone. Hope was Jesus, but hope has died. What's going on in her mind now? Didn't he just say, didn't he tell us over and over that on the third day he would rebuild? Could this really be happening? I don't know what's happening, but he's not here. And I got to tell somebody, somebody's got to know what I'm seeing right now. I, I, I got to go. So look at what happens in the next verse. It says, so, so she came running. Am I really reading this? It says she came running to Simon Peter, 
Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Simon Peter had just ran from Jesus. Simon Peter had been walking closely with Jesus. Jesus had been tied. He had been tied. He, and, and he fell away. You ever been there? Ever been close with God? Felt like, felt like you were heading in a direction with God and then things went a certain way that you didn't anticipate and you walked away from God? Simon Peter had walked away from God, but God sent Mary Magdalene to come running to him. Why? Because God wasn't finished with Simon Peter yet. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. I, I just love the way John describes himself. Like he's the one writing this. And he, say, <laughs> he says that she ran to Peter and she also ran to the disciple, the one that Jesus loved. If I'm going to write it, I'm going to get it in there the way I want it written. Come on, somebody. That's what John says. <laughs> the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. She's saying that because she don't know what's going on. She doesn't know. All she knows is Jesus isn't there. Look at verse 3. It says, so Peter and the other disciple, again, this is John, started for the tomb. And I just love John, how he writes. He says, both were running, not that John's competitive, but the other disciple, a.k.a. John, a.k.a. me, I'm the one writing this book, outran Peter. And reached the tomb first. I mean, that's a detail we needed to know, right? John outran Peter, whatever. There it is. It says he bent over. Now look at this, seriously. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. See, in those days, you guys know this, it, it was a different burial process. They, they wrapped their body like a mummification process. They mummified the body with strips of linen, wrapped them around them. It says he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but there's no Jesus there. He saw that and he didn't go in. Verse six, then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived all late and stuff because he's old and he can't run like John does. He gets there huffing and puffing. He arrived and then he went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there. And verse seven says, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. Now don't miss this detail. It says the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. The picture that John is drawing in his writing is that, that Jesus was wrapped in these linen strips and he had this cloth around his head. Some, some scholars uh, have said that, why, why did he have the, the, cloth, the burial cloth around his head? Maybe it was so that, so that for corpses that their, their mouth wouldn't open. It was a burial cloth wrapped around his head. And it says that, the linen strips were lying there. And it's as if there was a body inside it. The body is removed from the strips and the strips collapsed. But the linen cloth was not just lying there. The linen cloth was folded and neatly left. What's the significance of that? If someone had taken him away, they would not have been able to leave the linen cloths lying there as if the body had just left it. And in that culture, it was widely known that when the, when the master was sitting at the table, if he, if he wadded up his, his napkin when he finished eating, if he wadded it up and placed it to the side, it signified, I'm finished here. But if he folded it and left it, it signified, I'm coming back. The linen cloth was left folded. Jesus was not done here. And in verse 8, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and he believed. He saw and he believed. He saw that Jesus was not there. John was seated at the feet of Jesus, when he was on the cross, as he was dying, he was there when he took his last breath. He knew that he died. He saw him placed into that tomb and he looked into that empty tomb and he saw and he believed. And today, you weren't there to see Jesus lower down. But you've seen God do lots of things in your life. You've heard lots of stories about how God 
stepped into other people's lives. What's God saying to you today? He's saying to you today that Easter 2020 is not about going back and reading the story over and over and over again. It's not about a history lesson, but it's about what God wants to do in your life right now. Every person that you heard tell their story of where they were, how God showed up, and how they moved forward. What happened? They saw Jesus. They pursued Jesus. They believed in Jesus. And God changed their circumstances. And my word to you today is that's why we're here. You see, and the question for you right now is will you believe? I want to speak to your heart right now. You're looking into this camera. You're listening. You're watching. And your life is in crumbles. Some of you who are watching this right now, if there were a rope that you could grab onto that would pull you up out of the mess, you would do everything you could to get to that rope, but you can't see it. And God's saying, I am that rope. I am Jesus, and I have a name, and I am the hope that you've been searching for. Today, for you to take hold of me, you've got to push your life all the way into the middle. Trust me. Let me lead you. And it can all begin today. I want to pray with you right now. <sighs> Father, you are present in this moment as we watch on cell phones and tablets and TVs. God, the medium doesn't matter. It's the message that is timeless. And it's a message that you have preserved because the person who is contemplating all of this right now needs to know that you're here, you're for them, and you can change things. God, I pray right now that you will do what only you can do. Now, as you continue praying, heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's you right now, and you're saying on this Easter Sunday, I have been searching for hope in so many places and I haven't been able to find it. But I do believe in Jesus. And I think today God is calling me to follow Jesus. If that's you right now, I want you just, just, just in boldness. I know it seems weird, but I'm asking you right now, just on your screen, just type something out. That's me. I need you, Jesus. Give me a high five. Whatever it is, if you'll do that, if you'll do that, that's you saying, I see Jesus, I believe, and it's taking a step of faith. If you'll do that, we're going to reach out to you. We're going to connect with you, and we're going to help you to know what your next step is. We promise you we will follow up with you if you let us know that you're saying, Jesus, I need you today. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer, just from your heart to God. Jesus, I need you. Just say it in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. Just talk to God. I need you. My life is a mess. I need help. Today, I give you my life. Jesus, I believe in your death, your burial, your resurrection. And I believe that right now, you're here with me and you're offering me a brand new life. Jesus, I want that. I accept that. And today, I'm stepping into that brand new life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, if you just went on that road, on that journey with us, and you just made that decision to follow Jesus, I can't implore you, I can't beg you enough to let us know so that we can help you to, to take the next steps. So proud of you. I love you. Thank you for tuning in. And now, we're going to step into our time of communion. Before we finish today... <laughs> We thought it would be very special. On Easter Sunday, we've talked about the, the crucifixion and the resurrection and how Jesus poured out his life for all mankind, for every one of us. And so we thought it would be a very special time for us as a church family, even though we're not in a room together, to observe the act of communion. And so here's what I'm telling you right now. If you need to get up and get some things, it's okay. I'm going to talk for just a minute and set things up. Um, here at our church offices today, we don't have any grape juice. We don't have uh, the little crackers. What we have is, is, is Izzy Fizzy. So I don't know what that is, but they found a bottle of 
2003 Izzy Fizzy and King's Hawaiian Bread. And so we're going to work with what we have. If that's what you've got, if you, it doesn't have to be grape juice. It doesn't have to be some kind of cracker because what we're doing here is symbolic of what Jesus did. You say, Jeff, what are you talking about? What are we doing? Well, communion is a time when we collectively, the body of Christ, remember what Jesus did for us on that cross. And what he did for us was not only lay down his body, but his body was mangled. There's no other way to put it. His body was mangled. He was beaten to almost unrecognizable as a human being. And then he was nailed to the cross and his blood poured out. Why did he do that? He did that because we needed him and there had to be payment for our sin. And being on that cross, Jesus did all of that for us. And he said for us to remember his sacrifice. And so on the night when he met his disciples in the upper room, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the wine and he poured it in a cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. Why the blood? Because the scriptures tell us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And he gave it to them. They broke the bread. They poured the wine. They dipped the, the bread into the wine. And they ate. Lord Jesus, right now, we remember your suffering. God, there's nothing. There is nothing that we can even imagine that would help us to understand how horrible every situation that you went through for us actually was. But Lord, we know that it was terrible. And we know that you suffered for us. And today, God, on this day when we celebrate not your death, but your resurrection, we remember what you went through. We say thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take, eat. And so the scripture says they went out singing a song. And so we're going to go out today and our music's going to play on the way out. And we're just going to say to you and to your family, we hope that this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday has been a time when you've been able not only to look at Easter as a historical moment, but for what Jesus has done for you and your life. We hope that this has been special and that this has been meaningful for you. If there's anything that we can do for you, if, if you need help in figuring out how to connect, what your next steps are, please contact us. Comment in the, in the comments uh, on the sidebar and we will get in touch with you as soon as we can. Thanks for hanging out with us today. God bless. Have a great day. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died.
fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives Thank <laughs> you.